بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلى الله صل مبارك على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تمسك بهديه أما بعد. Speaking about the طرق التحمل أو صيغ الأداء the ways of taking a report and giving that report. We left off speaking on المشافهة and الإجازة and المكاتبة etc. And also we mentioned the part in which the author Al-Hafidh bin Hajar Rahimullah Ta'ala he said وَاشْتَرَتُوا فِي صِحَةِ الْمُنَاوَلَةِ With regards to Al-Munawala when the Shaykh hands his notes to the student that he has to give the ijaza. He can't just give the notes to the student but he has to verbally say that he has given the student ijaza. For obvious reasons one says this and for obvious reasons one may reject this. And one may say if he gives him his notes, then isn't the physical body language more than enough to establish the fact that the sheikh is pleased with the student to narrate from him? Just like a contract, which is well known uh, in the traditional schools of thought as bay'ul mu'ata, bay'ul mu'ata, between uh, Imam al-Shafi ta'ala, and other scholars, is it valid or invalid, bay'ul mu'ata? In which a person, uh, he picks up a commodity and another with another commodity and they trade it without saying anything, without making any verbalization whatsoever. Is that a valid contract or does there have to be or is there a must that there is a ijab in qabul? I'm selling, you're buying, we're trading, bartering, etc. So here he says, وَشْتَرَطُ He says, they hold it a, a shart, a condition. That when there is the way of taking a hadith known as munawala, is that there has to be al idhn biriwaya. There has to be an, an idhn biriwaya, which is the permission to narrate. We hear anwa al ijaza. And the author, Al Hafid Rahimullah, says this is the highest type of ijaza. The highest type of ijaza is when the Shaykh gives him the notes and also says, narrate them from me. And that's for obvious reasons as well. He has the notes himself and he has the direct verbal command. Uh, from the uh, Sheikh himself Khairan inshallah ta'ala And there are many different issues that pertain to this uh, Such as he says here in the Sharh وَسُورَةُ أَنْ يَدْفَعَ الشَّيْخُ أَصْلَهُ أَوْ مَا قَامَ مَقَامَهُ لِلطَّالِبُ أَوْ يُحْذِرَ طَالِبُ الْعَصْلَ لِلشِّيْخِ وَيَقُولُ لَهُ فِي السُورَتَيْنِ هَذِي رِوَايَةِ عَنْ فُلَانٍ فَرْوِهِ عَنِّي he says here, and uh, this is done when the sheikh does one or two things. Does one or two things. The first is, is when the sheikh gives his asal. And what's meant by asal is his original notes. His master copy. O ma yaqum, he says, maqamahu. O maqama, maqamahu. Or that which is a replacement of that master copy. A copy. Okay, the notes were rewritten. Uh, he gives them to the disciple, the talib, the student. Or... The student brings the asl to the sheikh. However he got that asl. The sheikh let him hold it, let him borrow it, whatever the case may be. The sheikh, the student wrote it down. Or whatever the case, he presents it to the sheikh. And the sheikh says, in either of these two scenarios, this is my uh, riwayah, my reports. You can now narrate them from me. You can now narrate them from me. He then says, وَالشَّرْطُهُ أَيْضًا أَنْ يُمَكِّنُهُ مِنْ إِمَّا بِالتَّمْلِيكِ وَمَا بِالْعَرِيَّةِ لِيَنْقُلَ مِنْهُ وَيُقَابِلْ عَلَيْهِ وَإِلَّا إِنَّا وَلَهُ وَاسْتَرَدَ فِي الْحَالِ فَلَا تُتَبَيَّنْ أَرْفَعِيَّتُهُ لَكِنَّ لَهَا زِيَادَةً مَزِيَّةٍ عَلَى الْإِجَازَةِ الْمَعَنِيَّةِ أَوْ الْمُعَيَّنَةِ وَهِيَ أَنْ يُجِيزَهُ الشَّيْخُ بِرِوَايَةِ كِتَابٍ مُعَيَّنٍ وَيُعَيَّن إلى أن مناولته إياه تقوم مقام إرساله إليه بالكتاب من بلد إلى بلد وقد ذهب إلى صحة روايته بالمكاتبة المجردة جماعة من الأئمة ولو لم يقترن ذلك بالإذن بالرواية كأنهم اقتفوا في ذلك بالقرينة ولم يظهر لي فرق قوي بين مناولة الشيخ الكتاب من يده للطالب وبين إرساله إليه بالكتاب من موضع إلى آخر إذا خلا كل منهما عن الإذن حافظ بن حجر رحمه الله تعالى he says 
that another condition is that he gives the notes to the student. Either he actually gives them to him, these are yours, or he lets the, him borrow them. He lends them to the student for him to rewrite it and to check it and make sure that it's accurate. Uh, and if, that's it, if that isn't the case, if he just gives it to him, and then immediately takes it back, then it isn't anything which is stronger than the previous types. It isn't nothing special except that it has a, a higher level than a general uh, uh, or than, than the type of ijaza, which is muayyana for something specific. Okay, um, that is, he says, well, yeah, and, you, Jesus, sheikh, and that is for a sheikh to allow the student to narrate one book from him. Okay, and to narrate how he is to, or to uh, specify how he is to report this book from him. And not give him a general ijazah. All his hadiths. You can only take this juz from me. Or this, these are hadith of fulan, and so on and so forth. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. So he says that if the munawala doesn't have idhin, if there's no permission, no verbal permission given, after he hands him the notes, then most of the people of knowledge, they don't consider it. They don't consider it. Not all, but most. Khair, inshallah. Let's move forward. He says, وَكَذَا اشْتَرَطُوا الْإِذْنَ فِي الْوِجَادَةِ وَالْوَصِيَّ بِالْكِتَابِ وَفِي الْإِعْلَامِ وَلَا فَلَا عِبْرَةَ بِذَلِكَ كَالْإِجَازَةَ الْعَامَةِ وَلِلْمَجْهُولِ وَلِلْمَعْدُومِ عَلَى الْأَصَحِي فِي جَمِيعِ ذَلِكَ He says, رحمه الله تعالى, they also, meaning most of the scholars, most of the people of hadith that deal with the narrations, they also hold it a condition to say that it is a must, a binding must, um, that there be permission when we have another type which is called al wijada And al wijada means when you find a book, you find some notes. Okay, a person found a book from his father, his uncle, it was in the house. He found the book. The possessions that his teacher gave him before he died or before he traveled, went to jihad, he was martyred, he didn't come back, or whatever the case may be. He found the book that he had to have previous idhan. He had to have, or it had to be permission from the sheikh. It had to be permission from the sheikh. Huh? Um, uh, it is written down. Or it was said to him before, but in most cases it's written down in the notes to narrate it from me. He also says al wasiya And al wasiya is basically a will. The will, when a person puts it in his will to take these narrations from me. And he passes on those narrations via a will. Um, and also pertaining to al-i'lam. And that is, uh, he says, وَهُوَ أَنْ يُعْلِمَ الشَّيْخُ أَحَدَ الطَّلَبَةِ بأنني أربي الكتاب الفلان عن فلان فإن كان له منه إجازة اعتبره ولا فلا عبرة بذلك كالإجازة العامة في المجازي له لا في المجازي به كأن يقول أجازت لجميع المسلمين أو لمن أدرك حياتي أو لأهل الإقليم الفلاني أو لأهل البلدة الفلانية وهو أقرب إلى الصحة لقرب الانحصار أن إعلام is basically making an announcement is to tell the student that the sheikh has such and such a book that he reports and he narrates from that person. But he doesn't give him ijaza yet. He doesn't say, I have allowed you to take it from me. But he's telling the student, this is what I have. Now, for us to understand there's a whole entire concept, we have to understand that there was no printing press back then. There was no printing press. And every book was... Or oh, all books were handwritten. There were manuscripts. There were manuscripts. Everything was written by hand or memorized by heart. You could uh, photocopy it with your own eyes, like many of the ulama used to do. But if that wasn't the case, you had to write it down. So there was no print of Sayyid Bukhari. There was no print of Musnad Ahmad. There was no print of Muttah Malik. So in other words, for a person to have a library and have these books, there was a great deal of time spent there was a great deal of wealth, a great deal of money, a great deal of efforts and suffering and pain that went into a person acquiring these books of hadith. So for someone else to go to another country, to another city, to travel with his own personal book, his own personal notes, then it had to be verified. Where are you getting this from that this hadith is inside of Bukhari? 
Where are you getting it that this hadith is from this one, from this tabi, from the sahabi? In the early, early generations, it had to be verified. And that was only verified through the hierarchy or the aristocracy of knowledge, aristocracy of ilm, of hadith. This is the master, he passes it on to the apprentice. And that's the only way that the, the hadith is felt. There is no one person that can just make up a book and say this is the narration of such and such from this companion to the prophet. It had to be in line. It, had to, it was pedigree. Okay, there was an isnad. And for someone to have a book, it had to be verified and it had to be witnessed and testified or attested to by a previous master. And there are different ways of verifying, different ways of attesting. And that is what is meant by a tahammul. That is what is meant by seal wal adad. That is what was meant by ijaza, munawala, i'lam. He wrote to the student, he gave the student the books, the student found the book, etc. Everybody understand this? Is that it has to be a way. Nowadays, you can just go into the bookstore and buy whatever you want. You can go online and download a PDF. It wasn't like that back then. And even now, with certain books that are printed, you find mistakes, you find errors, you find things that don't belong there, and they come from a khata, a mistake. And that's why we find different discrepancies in certain books that you memorize, such as the Surah Talatha. One version says this, another version says that, because it, something wasn't verified. Okay? Khayran, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully that's clear. So he says here, uh, with regards to Al-I'lam, and that is for the teacher to inform the student that he has a hadith, or he has hadith that he reports from such and such. Okay? It has to be something specific. It has to be an ibn. It has to be an ibn. He has to give him permission and not just, I told you about the hadiths that I have. Because the student can say, Sheikh Fulan reported to me from such and such, from such and such. No. It has to be ibn. It has to be permission given. He says, and this, if there is no permission, then it is basically useless. It's, it's of no value, such as ijaza amma, giving a general ijaza to everybody. I've given ijaza to everyone, huh? Or to someone who's unknown. I give ijaza to the child in your 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 uh, 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 the the child in your womb. He says to a woman if he comes out, who's that person in the womb? Is it twins, quadruplets, triplets? A male, female? Will they die? Will they live? He doesn't know. It's majhul. I'll give ijaza to anyone who comes in the next ten years. It's ijaza to something which is unknown, ma'dum as well, something that's non-existent. Whether it is the baby in the stomach, whether it is someone who doesn't exist yet. Or whatever the case may be, is of no tangible value. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. So hopefully that's clear. So we talk about the ijazah, then there is the mujiz, the one who's giving it. And then there's mujaz lahu. And then there is the one who's given the ijazah. And then there is the mujaz bihi. It is the thing that is actually given, the actual hadith or book that's being uh, passed down. Khayran, inshallah. Let's move forward. Uh, Al-Hafidh al Ta'ala, he then says, and this can show us how the sciences, uh, ilm al-hadith, how we take basic things in tadhkira regarding the ijazat and the turuq al and things like this, and how further details are in further books. Okay? He says here, ثُمَّ الرُّوَاتِ إِنْ اتَّفَقَتْ أَسْمَأُهُمْ وَأَسْمَأُ أَبَائِهِمْ فَصَائِدًا وَاخْتَلَفَتْ أَشْخَاصُهُمْ فَهُوَ الْمُتَّفِقُ وَالْمُفْتَرِقُ Now he goes back to the narrators. He's done talking about the ijazah and the munawala, etc. The narrators, the ruat. The narrators, he says, when they have uh, exact first and last names, exact first and last names, if not even more third name, but at least first and last names, um... And that's not even a literal translation. That would be equivalent of our culture today. But the literal translation, he says, their names are the names of their fathers. Because in the past, and in the Middle East, and the Far East, and among the Muslims, huh, whether they were the Arabs, or others besides the Arabs, but specifically the Arabs, or those who had similar culture, a person didn't have a last name. There was no last name. Okay, there was first name and name of father. That's, that was your name. There was no uh, uh, Ronald Martin. Unless Martin was your father's name. 
Okay, you had to, uh, whether, as we said, it wasn't just specific to Arabs. Other places, other cultures, other races had it, but we're talking about specifically what we know for sure, the Muslims and the Arabs, and then we said other cultures as well, they only went by a person's name and the person's father's name. That's how someone was identified. How did a person get into uh, having a first and a last name? In the modern world today, that's a very interesting story, uh, and that's a cultural reference, a colonial reference, which we can't get into right now. And our lesson is not on history, and is not on the different social and religious uh, changes that took place through the colonial uh, movement. Okay, right now it's important to know that that's how it was back then. Uh, and this branches off to many things, as the ulama of Islam say, with regards to imitating the kuffar, okay, resembling them. And a big part of resemblance is in the naming system, is in the naming system. And that's why you find Muslims that come from uh, countries that were heavily colonized or just colonized at all, you find oftentimes their naming system is a bit odd. It's a bit odd. In comparison to Middle Eastern or African or Far Asian, Far Eastern Asian countries that weren't as colonized and it wasn't as heavily colonized and totally taken over and dominated by the French or by the Germans or the Italians. This is a reality, okay? Um, you take someone from a Gulf country and you take someone from Algeria or Libya it's like night and day, their naming system. And their reasons why, as we said. Khayr and inshallah, that's for a side fa'idah. So he says, if the names of them, uh, of those narrators and the names of their fathers are the exact same, for Sa'idan, he says, or their grandfathers as well, but they're different people, he says, then this science, or this branch of science is called Al-Muttafiq Wal-Muftariq. Al-Muttafiq Wal-Muftariq. We have Abdullah... Ahmed. We have another Abdullah Ahmed. There are two people with the same names, Abdullah, and the father's name is Ahmed. But one is from uh, Dimishq and one is from Halab. There are two different narrators. How do we distinguish between them? One is trustworthy, one is a liar. There's a big difference. One person studied with this imam, another one didn't. It's life and death, night and day, east and west. Huh? With regards to these two people, we have to have a system, and that system is al-mutafiq wal muftariq As we previously explained before, uh, with regards to al baqaniya and with regards to al tafkira and we explained the benefits pertaining to this. Now, khairan inshallah ta'ala. Um, and the same can happen with regards to the muhmal. It could just be only one person. But they think it's another person. One narration, his name was mentioned. Another one, it wasn't. One chain, chain, his name was mentioned. And another one, it wasn't. It's just Muhammad. And then another chain, it says, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim. And they think it's a different person. Or they think it's the same person. Hmm? It can go both ways. Huh? He says, When it tafaqat al-asma'u khattan, wa khtalafat nutqan, fahuwa al-mu'talifu wa al-mukhtalif. Um... As far as if the names are similar in how they are written, they have the same structure of the letter, the letters or the, stru the, 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 the structure of the letters, but the quote-unquote, the dots are different, the nukat. Huh? Or uh, it could be an issue of uh, pronunciation. Huh? And how it is pronounced, then this is called Al Mu'talif Wal Mukhtalif. Al Mu'talif Wal Mukhtalif, just like we took in the previous books as well. So we have uh, uh, sim very, sim very simple, very easy, okay? Just like we previously explained regarding a Tashif, regarding a Tashif, naam, and regarding to Maqloob and things like this. We have Bashir and Bushair. Oh, and then we have a third, Bushayir. 
We have Hamid, we have Humaid, and we have Humayid. All of them are spelled the same way, the same letters, but the pronunciation, the nutq, is different. Okay? And uh, the same applies to, with regards to if the dots aren't there. Okay? If it's a Bashir or uh, uh, Yasar. If you take out the nukat, it's very similar. And as we said in the past, there was no printing press. There was no standardized print. Oftentimes, as you see in the, the early manuscripts of the Qur'an and Kareem, of the Mus'haf, Sharif, you'll find that there's no dots whatsoever, or very limited amount of dots. That's because they knew what the words were. Okay? They knew what the words were, and they didn't need those dots. Those dots were later on added. They were added later on. So, you take the word Bashir, or a better word, Bashar. Bashar is written the same as Yasar. Huh? Wahakaba. Khairan, inshallah, we explained that as before as well. He then says here, When it tafakat al asma'u, wa khtalafat al aba, aw bil aks, fa huwa al mutashabih. Wa kaza in waka al tifaku, filisim, wasmi al ab, wa lichtilafu finisba. As far as if the names are the same, meaning the first names, but the names of the fathers are different, or vice versa. Different first names, but have the same names of their fathers. Then this science, or this field, is called Al-Mutashabih. Al-Mutashabih. It's called Al-Mutashabih. Al-Mutashabih. Tayyip. Uh, he mentions an example here of Muhammad ibn Aqil. And Muhammad ibn Uqayl. One is from Naysabur, and the other is Firyabi. And they're both famous, and they're very similar in their tabaqah, in their age, and in the scholars that they took from, and the students that they had. So the whole purpose of this is distinction. It's to distinguish, and to differentiate, and to point out and pick out, and finally, or to, to classify it with a fine tooth comb. There was no mixing up and no jumbling up, as we previously had explained in detail, and how advanced and ahead of time the Muslims of the past were. Akhirin, inshallah ta'ala. He then says here, uh, and the same rule applies if they have the same name and the name of their fathers is the same as well, but their nisbah, their uh, ascription or affiliation is different. Huh? Whatever that nisbah is, whether it's nisbah to a country, nisbah to a town, nisbah to a city, nisbah to a hirfa, a, 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 a job, hmm? an occupation. In other words, same first name, same last name, different occupation. So we have John Smith and John Smith, for example, in our Western culture. John Smith and John Smith, same first name, same last name. One John Smith, we say John Smith, nah, he's the bottle maker. And then we have John Smith, who is the butcher. Different ascriptions to different jobs. Or John Smith from Boston. And then we have John Smith from Chicago, for example. Or in one city, the same city. Wahakeva. Khaydan, inshallah. He then says here, ويتركب منه ومما قبله أنواع منها أن يحصل الاتفاق أو الاشتباه إلا في حرف أو حرفين أو بالتقديم والتأخير أو نحو ذلك. He says here, um, and from what we've just mentioned and what we previously mentioned before is for there to be similarity in name or exactness in name or uh, he says in a harf or harfain, one or two letters, or taqdim, ta'khir, things like this, like we just explained. John Smith, John A. Smith, Yasar, Bashar, Bushayr, it's all concerning one basic concept, and that is similarity. And he mentions many examples of this, huh? For example, Hafs ibn Maysara, 
and Ja'far ibn Maysara. Hafs and Ja'far look similar when they're written on the old script. Ahmed ibn al Hussein, and we have Ahyad ibn al Hussein. Very similar. Ishtibat, huh? Mu'arraf ibn Wasil, Mutarraf ibn Wasil, Wahakada, like we just explained, huh? John Smith, Joan Smith. Smith could be written, spelled with an E instead of just TH at the end. Wahakada, huh? Khayran, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, he then says, and we're coming up, alhamdulillah, on the end of the book, the, he says, Khatima. He says, uh, the Khatima, which is basically the end of the book. He's, he's, he's summarizing and he's wrapping things up. Huh? He says, ومن المهم معرفة طبقات الرواة ومواليدهم ووفياتهم وبلدانهم وأحوالهم تعديلا وتجريحا وجهالة He says from the important things in this science علم الحديث is knowing the طبقات of the narrators their levels the levels of the narrators the chambers of the narrators uh, their degrees. And we mentioned before that the word tabaka has a general meaning of similarity in age and teachers and instructors. These two narrators are from one tabaka, meaning their age is similar. And they have similar teachers. A taqarab fi sinni wal isnad. Fi sin wa shuyukh. 26, 24, 23, like that. and they both study with the same teachers. A contemporary, a colleague, or even one may say a rival. Someone who is a year older than you, a year younger than you, when you were in Egypt. You guys both study with, with similar teachers. You may have an extra teacher you didn't study with. She has a teacher that you didn't get to, but you generally took from the same people in a city in Egypt. huh? So that's what's meant by the word tabaka, as we've explained. And this is one of the most important things when you start talking about the study of Isnad, is the tabaqa. So he says here, from the important things in this science is knowing the tabaqat of the narrators. Khayr, inshallah. He also says, وَمَا وَالِيدِهِمْ And knowing when they were born. وَوَفَيَاتِهِمْ And knowing when they died. And we explained that, alhamdulillah, a long time ago in detail. The utter importance of history like white on rice. We explained that with the examples, the importance of that. He says, وَبُلْدَنِهِمْ And also knowing their countries. Knowing their countries. Huh? Knowing their what? Knowing their countries. Um, and that's for the purpose of verification. That's for the purpose of precision, the purpose of accuracy. He's from Basra, he's from Kufa. His, these are his students, these are his teachers. This chain is connected, this chain is disconnected. that? Like we've explained before. Um, he gives an example of how one narrator could be from two tabakas. Two tabakas. And that is the example of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala an. He says from one aspect, in one angle, he's from the tabaka of the sahaba. He and Abu Bakr and Umar are in the same tabaka. They're all sahaba and they all heard from the Prophet directly. Rather, Anas radiallahu anhu, he narrated more hadiths than Ali and Abu Bakr put together. But... From another aspect, he is considered to be from another tabaka. He's not on the same level as Abu Bakr Umar because he's far younger than them. They're older than him. They did more things. They saw more things, etc. Uh, he says, also very important is to know the state of these narrators. What is their level of trustworthiness or lack of thereof? How strong they are? Or how weak they are. Hmm? How strong they are or how weak those narrators are. The strong narrators and the poor narrators. The student of knowledge who wishes to study Ilm al-Hadith, he has to get, he has to roll his sleeves up and get his hands dirty in this and read these things and practice. He says, Wajahalatan. And also a person being unknown, like we previously explained. The types of majhul, the types of jahala, and the reasons. He then says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, wa maratibu al-jarh. He says, wa aswa'uha al-wasf. 
بأفعل كأكذب الناس ثم دجال أو وضاء أو كذاب وأسهلها لين أو سيء الحفظ أو فيه مقال It's also very important to know the maratib al-jarh The levels of jarh The levels of a narrator being disparaged or attacked Like we explained before وَطَعْنِ إِمَّا يَكُونَ لِكَذَكَ We explained that What's meant by al-jarh The necessity of grading the narrators And speaking for them or against them For the sake of preserving the sunnah of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام We'll stop here بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى My advice to the students and to the learners, whoever you are, wherever you may be, is you must practice. You cannot take a 30-minute lesson just from me and think that's enough. Now you have to read and study what we took in this book, from this book. See if you can find it in the books on your shelf. Even in English, see if you can find it in the books on your shelf in Arabic. Go online, go and research. Read the books of Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala. Read his takhreej, irwa al gharil and asil sila sahiha and al-da'ifa, etc. Read those books and then you'll see some of the things that we discussed. This narrator, this is da'if, akhrajuhu fulan, this is a different tabaqa, this is mudallis, wa hakadha, wa hakadha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.